So um, I do want to jump into uh, kind of what I've been talking about. I've been a part of this series now for a few weeks, and, and uh, I, I really believe that what I'm talking about is really important. I've had, you know, a couple of people like, how long are we going to be in this identity series? You know, I'm like, okay, let me, let me get to it, because I really think that this is, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I really feel like this is a, a missing foundation in a lot of our walks with God, that we have stopped really knowing who we are. I feel like the church even sometimes. We don't know who we are as a church. We've seen this loss of identity at the root of so many of the uh, things that we're finding in our culture, in our world, um, uh, from our lack of understanding of what it means to be a man and a woman to um, to just sort of the flippant, callous way that we treat life, all life, from the life of the unborn all the way up through... uh, That's my... Was it the last service that this happened to? I'm sorry. It's all good. Oh, that's all right. I, if it wasn't the last service, I have a thing that I want to say, and it was, um, is that the mountains calling? Because I must go. Um, that's, anyway, that's, that's one of these days I'll, get, I'll make that happen. No worries. It's all good. Um, it happens actually surprisingly quite a bit to me um, when I'm sitting out there. So um, we have seen the loss of Christian identity just at the root of so many problems. And um, I think it's because we've lost the sense of what it means to be a human. We've lost our understanding of what it means to be created in the, in the, in the um, image of God, Imago Dei. Um, Tim Keller, for those of you who know, I've been reading a lot of Tim Keller lately because he has some things to say about this. But um, right before he died, he was interviewed by Kerry Newhoff on this podcast. And and Kerry Newhoff said, well, if you would change, could change one thing about your life, looking back, he was a pastor in New York City for a long, long time. He said, what would you do differently in New York? And Tim Keller said that I would help people better understand their identity in God. And he said, felt, felt like of all the things he would change, that would be one of them. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we started looking a couple of weeks ago, if you weren't around, at the creation story. We were seeing God creating man, humanity, and male and female. And um, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, we see that they were created, humanity was created with, with dignity and with purpose, and meant to live under the hand of God in humility. And I spent a little bit of time last week at the outdoor service talking about that. I, that we had this, we had this freedom in Christ, of course. We had this amazing freedom in Christ. Um, But that freedom is not like a do whatever you want sort of a freedom. It's actually, we were created to live subject to God and his will right? That, that's like, that's actually a big part of our identity, that we understand that about who we are. One of the things we're like, like going way out from underneath that, saying, let me just, let me just live under my will and, and um, my best interest and my ideas for this life. And I think we're, we're getting sideways in a lot of those things. Um, Paul says we should never use our freedom to do anything we want. In Galatians, he said, never use this as an opportunity for the flesh, but instead, uh, love and serve one another. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, is what he said. So Christ came to set us free. I'll tell you what he came to set us free from. He came to set us free from the slavery that we've been under to our flesh, like that we have to just do everything that we feel, desire, want, every whim, every every lust, every desire that we have, that we're kind of encapsu- and, uh, captured by that, held captive by that. And, and Jesus says, no, you're you're not. You, you can make choices that are different from that. You can do other things. You were created to live in submission, but it is in submission to God. We were created to live in willing submission to God. That is part of who we are. And so my prayer as we start this is that we would sort of settle into that aspect of our identity. And I, you know, I've spent a lot of time laying this foundation because I want to keep coming back to it. And I want to keep saying the same thing over and over. And you're going to start to hear it, um, that we have been created to live in willing submission to, to God. And that will become, when we start to settle into that, that will become the truest us it will become the truest sense of of who we are uh, in finding our identity in God. So this week, uh, last week I kind of looked at the the freedom piece. This week I want to look at the dignity piece. If you have a Bible, you want to open it up, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 8, which is just a phenomenal psalm. If you don't know Psalm 8, um, then uh, then you're going to get to know it today a little bit. It is really, really incredible. It's a psalm of David. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 is where we're going to start this off. While you guys are looking that up, I'm going to put this over here because I feel like I'm going to... You were afraid I was going to walk over and have you start talking. And uh, you're like, yeah. uh-oh, he's coming close. Uh-oh. All right. Psalm 8, verse 1. Here we go. Psalm of David. O Lord, you'll recognize this as soon as I start to say it. O Lord, our Lord. 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your hands, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, and all the, also the bird, beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Um, God, as we read from your word today and we start to pull it apart and look at what you have for us, I pray that your spirit would speak way more loudly than my voice. God, that you would speak directly to our hearts. If I'm saying anything, God, that is not of you, I pray your spirit would just take that and just rewire it in our hearts so that we would hear from you and not from some dude up on the stage. I give this to you through your son. Amen. Okay, um, so this is a, uh, it's kind of this, to me, it's, it's sort of ancient picture of identity from King David. I want to start with this as we look at this, that, that David, you notice kind of right off the bat, he speaks not only to the dignity of the created, but also the dignity of the creator, right? Matter of fact, number one on your outline, uh, and I'll unpack this as we get into it, that your identity is not a psychological issue as much as it is a theological issue. In, in other words, our identity and our, our theology are, are like linked together. If our identity is in tatters, then that's only because our view of God is in tatters. Uh, I, don't, I don't hate you know, psychology is maybe, I don't know, some people do. I think it brings something valuable to the table. But very often the problem, it's not like a mind problem for us. We think it is. Um, and people will tell us, oh, it's just the way your mind's working. It's not so much a mind problem or a how you were raised problem or, a, or an abandonment problem. Really, I think the heart of the problem is that it's a worship problem, that we've gotten our worship misdirected because we don't know who God is. We don't understand what that is. We failed to see God for who he is as majestic, and powerful and glorious. And so therefore, we failed to see ourselves who God created us to be, right? We have to start with the first one. We have to start with understanding God, and that's going to help us understand ourselves. David starts Psalm 8 out right off the bat, right out of the gate. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, right? Like right off the bat, let's establish who God is. Let's establish what he has done. You have set your glory, David says, you have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. David, like, he just has such this, this high view of God in the earth, over the earth, up in the heavens, everything in between. Um, his name, David says, is majestic. The whole earth, he'll later say, is full of your glory. So if we, if we, don't, if we don't start there, if we don't have a creator who is full of majesty and full of power and full of glory, then the created cannot have dignity and worth. Like, what would give that to them if we don't have the one who created us full of his own majesty and his own power? Uh, I'll read a little uh, quick section from this book called The Image Restored. The Colson Center um, puts out, a, a actually has a, a worldview course, and this is one of the books in there, um, the Glenn Sunshine and Timothy Paget. But here's what he says, or here's what they say. Since the value of human life flows from the image of God, so does human dignity. And since the image of God is shared by all people, all of us have an intrinsic dignity that is distinct from anything else about us. The supreme value, listen, the supreme value of the image of God far outweighs any other consideration in determining our worth. 
right? You understand that? The supreme value of the image of God far outweighs any other consideration in determining our worth. So the, so the basic truth is that the more that we realize about the God that we were imaged after, then the more we're going to understand the image of God inside of us. And the more that our worship will be real and will be true, and the more we'll be able to understand the glory and the honor that God has bestowed on us as the pinnacle of his creation, as, as humanity. Um, this is what we have been created for. Our theology and our identity have to be tied together. If we're going to continue to talk about identity, we have to understand that. Matter of fact, number two, I'm going to kind of reiterate this point, but say it in a different way. Uh, without the majesty of God, there is no basis for the dignity of man. Without the majesty of God, there's no basis for the dignity of man. So David says, look at verse um, three, if you still have Psalm 8 open. He says, when I look at your heavens, at the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and have crowned him with glory and with honor. Crowned him with glory and with honor. If you don't see the majesty of God, or maybe for some of you sitting in the room, maybe you don't even really, you know, I even made the transition to believing that there is a God there at all. Um, then what would possibly give man worth and, and dignity if there is no, let's say there's no God. Matter of fact, let's look at those two options. The first is, oh yeah, there's a creator full of majesty and glory. And the second thing is that um, when we look around at the universe and we see the sun and the moon and stars, we say, oh, that's, just, that's just, it's like a great cosmic accident. Right? These are our, kind of our two options in, in approaching this life and, and, and humanity, all that stuff is just kind of accidental. It's an accidental occurrence. If there's a, let's start with the, there is a great and majestic creator. If there is a great and majestic creator, then uh, we would be right to see all of his creation as his art, as, as an artistic endeavor. God says, I created you valuable. I created you precious. And I have, he says, crowned you with glory and with honor. I mean, that's a pretty amazing statement from the God who created the, the cosmos. And David, like you, you watch David as he's going through the psalm, he's like in, in awe of this. He's like, well, who are we that you're mindful, mindful of us? Like, what, who is the son of man that you, that you actually care for? Like, David's trying to wrap his mind around who we are because he has such a firm grasp on, grasp on who God is. Right? He, he understands the majesty of God so well that he's trying to say, man, who are we that you've created us like this? Okay, so do me a favor here. Listen, let's take it out of the cosmos for just a second. Like bring it down to like you sitting in this room, in this seat, listening to me today. Okay, because this is an important thing for us to do is to start to take it out of some sort of, um, oh yeah, that's, that applies to everybody that too. This applies to me. This applies to me. Just work with me through this. You want to know, you want to know your identity in God. Here's how you have to start. You have to start with the fact that you have a great and a majestic creator whose name is higher than anything you can imagine. It is bigger, it is grander, it is higher than, than anything we can wrap our minds around. And that creator created you. And the way that he created you wasn't just any old way. He didn't just form you, shape you. He created you in his image. So the one who created everything, the cosmos, everything that we see, he created you. That, not, not just like you in general, you in particular, you, you, you. <laughs> I get sorry to point. I know that's rude. My mom would be mad at me. Um, but each and every one of us, he created us in his, in his image, and that image that is resting on you, the image that you were created in, is so distinct and so noble that David says it's just short of divinity. Just short of divinity. God has given that to, to you. He put us over all of creation, over all the works of his hands, over all the rest of the created order. Everything that he created, he said, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna step back from that. I'm gonna let you guys work on that. You're gonna run that he, stuff that he built, the stuff that he shaped. He put it all, David says, under our feet. And then he made this crown. And we'll talk about this crown in just in a little bit at the end of the sermon. It's this crown of glory and of, and of honor. And here's a, here's a kicker. It's an amazing line. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him? 
Have you ever thought about the fact that God has his mind set on not everybody, not humanity, you? Like God, God's mind is, is full of you. Do you understand what it means that God has created humanity with dignity and with honor? Like, is that settled into who you are? Is that how you see yourself? Is that how you walk around? You understand the, 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 the magnificence of the creator and then the magnificence of his creation, of you. I think most of us don't really do that. We don't really think that we're, we're crowned with glory, crowned with honor. We don't see ourselves that way. And I'm standing in front of you saying, church, it's time that we start understanding this. Because if we're going to start to formulate an identity, start to understand what God has said about this, we have to understand the position that he has placed humanity in and what he has done for us. We have to understand that we have been uh, crowned with glory and with honor. Do you, like, do you understand that? Does, does the, think about, I don't know, the addict standing on a street corner. Do they understand that they have been crowned with glory and with honor? Someone who, I don't know, never takes a bath or sitting in, in a jail cell somewhere. Like, do they understand that they have been crowned with glory and with honor? Um, or, or my guess is most of them do not. I would say my guess, most of us take it out of the prison cell or whatever and just bring it here. Most of us probably don't either, which means that we are believing a lie from Satan about our identity. We are hearing what someone else has to say about us, and we are not hearing what God has to say about us. Right? This is something that we believe all the time, and we'll get to this in just a second. Let's go to the second scenario. Let's say that's first scenario. We have a creator, majestic, powerful, created us, crowns us with dignity and glory and honor. Um, the other option is that someone looks at the heavens, looks at the moon and the stars and the works of your hands. Well, not the works of your hands. He looks at the moons and the stars and the cosmos. He says, oh, that's just, a, um, that's just an accident. You know, like that's just kind of came about. It was just like big explosion stuff and all these things sort of just, just, just happened that we are this kind of random collection of, of molecules and atoms. Um, and if, if this is the case and we just kind of came about accidentally and that there's, there's no plan, no purpose, no key loss purpose in it, um, then really, um, well, well, I guess I would say, well, where does then our worth come from? Like, do we have any, any purpose? Do we have any, any worth? If there is no purpose, there is no reason for our existence, and we are just on the other side of, of some accident, then that changes the way that we'd see ourselves. That all of a sudden, the dignity and the honor that God had bestowed on us, if he's there, if he's alive, if he's real, then and all of a sudden, that kind of, kind of goes out the window. I'll read one more little section from a different book. If I could recommend one, I would recommend this. It's called Faithfully Different by Natasha Crane, a Regaining Biblical Clarity in a Secular Culture. It's really, really good. Um, here's what she says, and it's about this whole kind of cosmic accident stuff. She says, the mainstream scientific consensus is that all life developed from a single-celled organism that lived roughly 3.5 billion years ago. Some of you have heard this sort of stuff. According to evolutionary theory, the process of natural selecting, selection acting on random mutations to DNA has produced the wide variety of life forms we see today, including uh, humankind. Furthermore, it's assumed that the evolutionary process is blind and purposeless, not directed toward any goal. Given this picture from mainstream science... Man is not the product of a purposeful creator, but rather the product of an indifferent chance process. This also implies that man is different from other living things only in degree, not in kind. We are simply a highly developed animal, lucky to have come into existence after billions of years. Right? So this is kind of like, I mean, this is like just sort of the way things are. And if we take away... So if we take away God, creator, majestic, all, none of that stuff, take all that away. You know, people sometimes look at faith and they think that our faith in God is responsible maybe for feelings of unworth or unworthiness or, or you know, self-rejection or anything like that. To me, it's, it's almost just the opposite. Like, Imagine sitting down with some poor guy who's like, man, I just don't, I just don't feel like I have any value in my life. Maybe things have gone terribly wrong for him and, and he's like lost everything that he had and he just doesn't have any value, doesn't have any worth. And you sit down with this guy, you're like, oh, let me, let me tell you something. And you don't believe anything about a creator or anything like that. I think kind of, you know, thinking through it, what's the best you can offer him? 
kind of the best you can offer them is something like, I just don't agree. I think you're great. You know, like, I think that you have value and that you're full of, of, of worth. It's, it's like, we almost, if we get rid of the idea of a creator God, it's almost all you got. That's kind of the most you can offer. You take away your basis for telling them that they are wrong. And you almost, in some sense, you kind of almost have to agree with them, you know, that if we're all accidents, then man, yeah, I get it, man. You're worth, you're actually not worth that much more than, you know, I don't know, a hedgehog or something. Like, it's, you almost have to, have to agree with them. The fact that we were created means that our feelings of worthlessness or purposelessness, purposelessness are not a reality. They are not a reality because we are created with purpose. We are created with worth because there's a God who has bestowed dignity and honor and value on mankind and that we are beautifully created, fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says, uh, precious, lovable, worthwhile. Matter of fact, so worthwhile that he said, I'm, you're worth my son on the cross. I'm going to give that much for you. Amen? It's, that's just, this is the worth that God has bestowed on. And that's not an opinion. It's a, it's a reality based on a transcendent and timeless truth. David even struggles to understand it. He's like, who are we? What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you, like, who are we to deserve this kind of an honor for God's mind to be occupied with us? You take away God and no wonder we have no self-worth. We're walking through this identity series and we're trying to figure out what is our identity in God? What does it mean to have our identity in Jesus Christ? And I'll tell you the identity that most of us carry around, the identity, I'll say this is true for my heart, probably for a lot of yours too. It doesn't come from our creator. When we think about things like this, you're like, I've never really had that thought in my life that I was created with dignity and worth. What, where we get our identity is, is from what other human beings have to say about us. This is, for most of us, probably where we gain the most of our identity. Uh, it's been said that we are not who we think we are. We are who other people think we are. Right? This is kind of how we form our identity. So some other human being, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of other human beings who love you. I don't know, maybe your mom thinks you're great and you're full of worth and value and honor. That's right. That's, and hopefully there's other people that besides just your mom. But if you don't have, <laughs> I, I would hope, um, but... But if you don't have a creator, then all the sort of human opinions have to be taken a little bit on the same playing field. So one person thinks you're full of, of dignity and honor, and then somebody else thinks you're a piece of trash. Like, there's nothing really to differentiate. They're both just human opinions. That's the identity that most of us carry around. We have given other people the right to determine our worth and our dignity. We have given that away. We have given that to somebody else. When here in the scripture says, no, 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 that's not who gives you your worth and your dignity. You don't carry that around. What other people have to say about you is not yours to carry. What God says about you is the only thing that you have to carry. That is where it is. No wonder we have an identity crisis because we don't know who we are. We don't know who we've been created to be. And without the majesty and the glory of God, well then, yeah, I get it. Like what else is there? What else is there? Now listen, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking just in my own head, as I, if I was sitting out there listening to this, I would probably have a thought, a little bit, a little bit cynical thought, but that's the way I roll when I listen to people preach. Um, okay, you know, all right. So I, I, I get it. You know, you're crowned with glory and dignity. I'll just tell you though. I mean, I, I don't see that in my life. <laughs> I just don't feel like that's totally true. I mean, I, I look at my life. I mean, I'd love to be thought of as some special, you know, amazing human created artistically, all this sort of stuff. I mean, that's cool, but it doesn't feel like, like it's true. Like I'm a glorious, rational, created being. Um, and so what's the problem? Why, why is it so hard for us to see that about ourselves. We want to believe it, but we look at our lives and we don't always see it. We see the mess that we've made of things. We see the mess that humanity has, just last night, humanity has made of things. So how in the world can the Bible say that we are some radiant, wonderful creation? It doesn't feel like that to me. Okay, so let me start with just reminding you of what I said a couple of weeks ago. Um, your identity is not going to be found in your feelings. 
okay? So just remember that. Everything, every time you look around and you start to have this feeling like it's not what the Bible says it is, and you still need to fight against that because that is not a reality. Your feelings are going to go every which direction. Um, you need to know what God says about you. That is going to be the truest truth that we can stand on. So um, the first thing is be careful of, of, of trusting your, your feelings on this, but let's move beyond that. Um, there's a passage in Hebrews chapter 2 that I want to I want to kind of close with, but I want to remind you or tell you about if you've never read it before. If you have a Bible, you want to turn to Hebrews 2, you can. But the, the writer of Hebrews, um, whom we don't know, of course, uh, is quoting Psalm 8 for us and says something really amazing. It's hard to pick up on because it's kind of weird the way that it's worded. But I'm going to explain it to you and we'll see if we can understand this from a different perspective. So the writer of Hebrews says, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Quoting back from Psalm 8, you made him a little low, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And here's what he says. Okay, so this is commentary. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, He left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Okay, so 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 just keep that in mind because like we're looking around, we're like I don't know. My life's kind of a train wreck. My marriage is kind of a train wreck. My seems like nothing seems to be going right. Majesty, honor, glory, all that stuff doesn't seem to compute. It doesn't seem to make, make sense to me. So the writer of Hebrews says, is, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Here's the kicker. Here we go. But we see him. Right? So it's almost as if he says, listen, I get it. At the present, it it doesn't look like everything is under his control. Your life, your pain, your sickness, your family, your country, your marriage, your world, whatever it is. You'd say, I'm not wearing a crown of glory and honor. I feel like I'm wearing a crown of anxiety and pain or something else. That feels like my crown right now. Um, How can we be these great and wonderful things? The, The writer of Hebrews says, oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. You're finding your identity in the wrong thing. You are trying to find yourself by looking out at everything else other than at Jesus. At present, we do not see yet everything in subjection to him, but here's what you do see. We see him. We see him. And when you get that, when you, when you figure out what it means to lock your eyes on Jesus, then all of a sudden, all this stuff starts to fall in place. Number three, last one. You will know the truth about your identity by knowing Jesus. You will know the truth about your identity by knowing him. If you are not looking at him, if you are looking everywhere else, and absolutely, you see this whole thing is like this broken circus. Nothing seems to make sense. Nothing seems to go. If Jesus isn't the source of your identity, then how you see yourself, how you understand yourself, you're going to mess it up every single time. You need to see through Jesus. You need to see through Jesus. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned, listen, it's going to sound familiar, crowned with glory and honor. Jesus himself, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So in other words, what God is saying is somehow through this whole entire process, Jesus's crown of glory that God gives to him on the cross, that crown of glory is somehow passed on to humanity. And it is set on, on top of our heads. This is, this is who we are, church. This is who we are, that because of the death of Jesus Christ, that we keep our eyes fixed on all the time. This is who we are. Because of his death, God has crowned us with glory and with power. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. In that moment, when we put our faith in him, he became our covering. This is our identity. This is who we are. So you walk out of here today, and it doesn't matter you know, how, what struggle you're facing in your life. Those aren't probably going to magically go away like that, but they don't matter in the big scheme of things if you've got your gaze fixed on Jesus, if you've got your eyes locked on him, no matter how you think of yourself, no matter how you failed, how you've dropped the ball, no matter what other people think of you, no matter how many people you have disappointed, you walk out of here knowing that the God who created the universe and the son who gave his life for you has crowned you and he thinks that you are the greatest thing that he has ever created. This is who we are. This is who we are. 
If this cannot be the foundation of our identity, then nothing else is going to work. And you know what we're going to start doing? We're going to start going around to all these different places and we're going to start trying to figure out who we are. And every time somebody says something about us, every time somebody says something against us, good for us, or whatever, it doesn't matter. That's where we're going to find our identity because we don't know this stuff, that the core of our identity and the core of the identity of the people around you is that we have been made in the image of God and we've been crowned with glory and we have been crowned with honor. And listen, to say anything less is to just not believe God. It's to believe a lie. Amen? Amen. Okay.